A beautiful Saturday afternoon. Good afternoon everybody. Welcome to our Wild Earth Safari Drive this afternoon. My name is Mark. I have Brian on camera with me. And uh, I think the sun might have come along this afternoon, being a Saturday and all. I hope you're all enjoying your weekend. And I hope we can make your weekend a little bit better for you this afternoon. Andrew is in final control at the moment. And Brent and Alex are in the other vehicle and we'll cross over to them at some point for now though lovely hot afternoon and on a hot afternoon like today we are going to have a look at some of the water holes and some of the some of the dams because it's pretty i'm pretty sure that there's going to be some action i think we'll start just popping down to gary dam very much like we did yesterday afternoon i think there might be some elephant always this time of the year we get a lot of elephant activity down at Jumil Pogari Dam and quite often you actually can get to know some of the herds that come by every year. They seem to have a, a I wouldn't say a routine, but they have a, a seasonal path. They have a seasonal rotation between here and the Kruger Park. Going to the hyena den this time of the afternoon. Afternoon stations, marketing mobile. Okay. Hi Ephraim, where did you leave that uh, Ingwe this morning? Ledwood Road. Mm -hmm. Okay, copy, thanks. Now, unfortunately, we weren't able to come out this morning because we had an internet connectivity something somewhere between here and satellites and undersea cables and, and the stuff that I don't really understand because it doesn't have any legs. Two, four, six, or eight or more. And so I'm not too sure what was up this morning, but we couldn't broadcast, we didn't have internet. And so, to fill you in, it was a wonderful morning to start with, because we, we came down to the dam and there was a leopard lying on the dam wall. And unfortunately, I couldn't see who it was, because we were still quite far away. We were just in front of Vuitella Lodge, and he was on the dam wall. And as soon as we approached, he dropped down below the dam wall and disappeared. I spent probably half an hour or more hoping that we were going to go online, hoping that we were going to get broadcast and hoping even more that I would find him. But I didn't. And in my wandering around, it sounded like, well, by the sounds of things, he kind of slipped past us in the drainage line and Ephraim found him further down this Mulwati River towards Twin Dams. I was just checking now with Ephraim where he left him. And there's a spot on the other side of the Mulwati near Mumba Road, between Mumba Road and Ledwood Road. I was there actually, just recently, there's some pans, some old mud wallows in there, where he was probably holed up, actually, I forgot, I'm driving past the dam. Not much activity, not as much as there was yesterday afternoon. Yesterday afternoon was a very active afternoon. At the moment, mostly just buffalo and a hippo. Looks like maybe a hippo with the youngster. Uh, we'll just go and stop in the shade for a few minutes on the other side to have a look. Uh, 
and then I think I've got a youngster actually. Must have been hippo's head that I saw that I thought was another hippo. So I fly. Fly away, fly. There's a muddy buffalo if ever I've seen one. I think it's the same boy we always see, this is covered in mud. Heron flying off. At least 20 buffalo that are here, but not much in the way of other wildlife. Hippo with a lovely big terrapin on his back. Oh, and the heron just landed there. I bet the heron wishes he was on the hippo's back. I've seen that sometimes, hippo carrying a heron and then the hippo submerges itself just enough so that you can't see the hippo but you see this heron sort of gliding along the surface of the water. Somewhat uncanny. I see some vervet monkeys hopping around further back. <laughs> right, so. No, I promise. I promise. Quite an impressive buffalo, this full of mud. Now the talk was that it was a quarantine male. At first Ephraim said he thought it was Kunuma, but later on he amended it and said that he thinks it was the kun was, was quarantine male because it was a little bit darker than Kunuma. The only way to really settle it is to go down there and start nosing around and have a look. I can hear a woodpecker behind me. 
and rapping on the wood like it was a door knocker. Now that is actually a particular rap on the wood that's got nothing to do with digging holes or looking for insects. It's actually a territorial call and after all these years I still get so mixed up with the different woodpeckers rapping and tapping. Rap a tap tap. That's a short one. I wonder if that's maybe Bennett's. I think we need to continue. As long as the sun is beating down, everybody is going to be just dozy and sleepy. Everybody, I mean buffalo, everybody. And good time to be here would maybe be a little bit later this afternoon when it starts cooling down. Maybe some other things will be coming. I see some monkeys are drinking actually on the other side. I don't know if you saw that, eh? Brian. No. Right there. But I mean, there are actually some of them coming down to drink. Sadly, if we try and go over there, I think they'd all run away down into the drainage line. Just a little bit too far to zoom in nicely. Also, just to let you all know, I know Scott said goodbye. Scotty's gone off on his leave. I've just had mine, just come back from my week off. So Scott's gone off on his week. He'll be back next week. And then it'll be Brent's turn. Right, let's follow the drainage line. Hello, Starling. Let me just say hello to you quickly. Only one starling in this part of the world with a dark eye, and that's the Birchall's starling. And I suppose most of the birds we're going to see this afternoon are going to have a similar posture, panting. And we have a couple of birds to look for. we still got to look for a black-collared barbet for Marco in New Jersey, I think it was. And who was it? I think it was Chris wanted it to find a green wood hoopoe. Well, it's not something we can purposely look for. It's something that we can maybe come across if we're lucky, or if I hear them, we can at least stop and listen. Saturday night and it's all right. Uh, now you pose, Heron. Now when a cormorant or a darter does that, they're drying their wings, but there's no need or there, rather there's no reason why a heron would have wet wings so what it is doing is it's probably it's baking the inside of its feathers it helps, the heat helps with things like feather mites and perhaps lice but also it helps to bake the shaft of the feathers, strengthen the feathers no doubt feather there's very seldom get to see the light of day Morning Donna, or oh, afternoon from me, but morning to you. Donna's in Maine wanting to know if the dam dries up, if Gary Dam would dry up, where would all the buffalo go? I suppose it's a fairly easy answer to that Donna, that just move on to another water hole or another dam that has water. There are some larger water bodies around here, and you know what, 
it might very well happen. We've got a few more weeks left of what we call the wet season, but whether it's still going to rain or not is a, a, a big question. We oh, hang on. some talk on the radio, I thought I'd listen to um, I can't imagine that we're going to have such a heavy rain that it's going to actually fill up the dams any more than they are and because they aren't really that full to begin with going into the dry season there's a very good chance that they're going to be very very low towards the end of the dry season uh, dams like Bifflesook Dam, Bifflesook Dam is still quite a, very, quite a deep body of water is a little bit greater. Of course it's all got to do with surface evaporation there is and it's these hot dry days that we get that are going to be um, these the water holes will be losing most of their water very quickly at any rate. So I think we could maybe even expect unfortunately we're not likely to be here through the dry season but it would be interesting with the camera being here when it comes back. It would be interesting if, if the zoomies were to sort of take note of something on the edge of the water, take note of the gradual drop in the water level uh, and, and keep an eye on that. There are some much bigger dams north of us, south of us. There's Arethusa Dam, which is very, very big. Not, that's not likely to dry up at all. Um, on Chitwa Chitwa, there are big dams. And up on Biffles, are, that would take a severe drought to dry up. And I suppose what would happen is these boys would have to move to those areas. Or they'd move down towards the Sand River, the Sabi River. I don't know if they'd get as far as the Sabi River though, it's down in the southern, right southern tip of the southern edge of the Sabi sand. Probably enough buffalo down there anyway, but these buff don't move over very large distances. One of the reasons why we see these buffalo hanging around is because they've decided to leave the big breeding herds that, well sadly we haven't seen any of them recently, but some of these big breeding herds of anywhere up to five six hundred individuals sometimes cannot stay in an area for too long they they need to constantly be on the move for better grazing and these old boys would prefer to just lie around in the mud and find the little bit of grazing that they can i need a piece of worry that one's too far and i'm too lazy to get up I'll find some more with the buffalo come these tiny little flies that are, I've mentioned it before. Those of you who are new, wonderful world here in Africa. But if you the buffalo come with the flies, the buffalo come with the flies. Yeah, what would seem that way sometimes. Actually, it's one of the reasons why they lie in the water sometimes because the flies can't get to some of the areas on their body that irritate them the most. I've often seen buffalo actually putting their whole faces in the water to stop the flies getting up their noses and I can I can empathize there because I wish I could do the same sometimes. So I just need a little bit of a fly swatter courtesy of the local quarry bush. You want something? Yeah I'll give me a piece as well. Ow. As soon as they tickle and you end up slapping yourself in the face all the time. Sometimes even snort one up the nostril. Oh yes. Um, also I've just come from an area where uh, there's an overabundance from the marulas I suppose. There's an overabundance of Drosophila fruit flies and they have this annoying habit of buzzing around your face once and then they do a loop and go straight up your nose. And it's the most ticklish thing of all. And you never know whether they come out again or whether they've gone into your, whether they've gone in. 
control. I'll deal with any number of insects any day just to be out there. Of course, it gets difficult up in East Africa when you've got tsetse flies because they, they're not ticklish. They hurt. They, they don't have the anesthetic that mosquitoes have. And the reason why we tend not to feel mosquito bites is because they inject you with a little local anesthetic so that you can't feel the waspus, the little needle drilling into you. Tetsi flies got a much bigger needle on the tip of its face through which it sucks blood and they're not courteous enough to use a, an anesthetic so it hurts. It's like, it is, it's like a needle. It's like a, putting a needle into your... And I have a habit of just trying to find the most sensitive part of your body. Green pan. Where's green pan? <laughs> green pan is on torchwood. boundaries, but they're very, very far to the east. Seven Madutch, seven wild dogs. See, sometimes you just have to hold a branch, then you don't get any, excuse me, you don't get any flies. I used to use a feather if I was working or sitting at a desk. And I just had to hold the feather, you know, none of them would bother me. The hyena den is not active. I can't imagine why they would be this time of day. Now, just passing Chelapan, another buffalo in Chelapan. Oh, that. There's a lot of shouting, there's birds shouting. Not at the buffalo either. Although the lure is not shouting, there's a go away bird. Um, Sometimes you never know, you're never going to find out. Some the grass is along, birds can be shouting at a mongoose or a snake or a bird or a rival. Or oh, they're just having a bad day. Questions at wildearth.tv is the email address. Those of you that are new or tweet at hashtag safari live in case you want to send a question or a comment or you want to get in touch with us here are leopard tracks heading south he was on this road brian oh really yeah after we were in the drainage line you must have come out onto the road and then head down because here are his tracks the little son of a cat yeah he lured us into the drainage line and then just walked, casually walked out onto the road and cruised down the road Question coming from Fiji. Hi Trent, haven't heard from you for a while. Trent is in Fiji. On Fiji. Is it in or on? I say it's on because it's an island, isn't it? Um, Trent's saying that there were seven wild dogs on uh, Nkoro this morning. Could be the same wild dog, Trent. The same that they probably moved. I can see if they were on Nkoro, they would have moved north. Pretty much in a straight line, I suppose, if they're on the Kruger Park boundary, onto Torchwood. And yeah, I'm sure that we would have seen that pack here. 
there have been signs of two different packs here recently. There's the big pack of 14, which is the, the half tail pack. And there's that pack. To show if the total is seven, we shall have to wait. I think it's two packs that we actually have around here. So now what I want to do, I want to do some, we're going to go into the riverbed from here because this is where he was. Drop back into the drainage line, yeah, back into the Mulwati after he was walking on the dam's road. Now, just on the other side of the Mulwati, going up Mamba Road, this is Mamba Road. Oh, very thick stands of monkey orange. Teresa wants us to look at it every now and then. It's just a little bit, in fact, there's a big torchwood up there. Where he was at that torchwood. Um, you can see it, let me get my finger going. There, that big tree there, not this one here. Okay. But yeah, that's the big torchwood up there on followed elephants through there recently and we've been in there a lot of a lot of uh, few times actually in the past Mishu and Duna those mud pans hopefully things are going to be fine going through the riverbed because I think being a hot day like today he might have come back down to the riverbed as it is cooler down here more shade bigger trees and perhaps the opportunity to snag a pushback or a Low signal here. Uh, um, well. Okay, well, I think maybe we have to go to drain while I'm looking in the riverbed. Normally, it's fairly good here. But I'm going to look around in the riverbed. Good afternoon everyone, welcome on Drive. Um, Brent here and I've got Alex on camera and Andrew in FC and then Mark and Brian on the other vehicle. Uh, hopefully we're going to have a successful afternoon looking for some cats. Uh, unfortunately yeah, we had issues this morning but unfortunately those couldn't be helped so we're just going to have to work twice as hard this afternoon uh, to make up for it. I uh, hope you guys enjoy. Afternoon, Mark. What area are you working at the moment? Okay, copy. I'm going to head towards Treehouse um, by Philemon's Dip. Nice and hot this afternoon, probably around 33, 34 degrees Celsius, uh, which is about 90 odd Fahrenheit. So Mark's checking um, down in the Mawati drainage for tracks of a female leopard. Um, we're going to go check um, towards Treehouse Dam and around Philemon's Dip for the male leopard uh, tracks that were seen yesterday. Hopefully one of us gets some luck.
quite funny this morning. So you go again. Good afternoon, Sandy from New York. Oh, hello. Um, Sandy would like to know when the dry season hits, will the animals move elsewhere? Sandy, I'm going to get to your question in a second. I just need to have a close look at these tracks. Aha, tricky, tricky. There was a monkey track that's been half, half been driven over, so it looked very similar to a wild dog track, but it wasn't. So, sorry, Sandy. Sandy would like to know. Okay, guys, uh, Sandy, I'll get your question later. We're just going to cross across to Mark quickly. And we've got a hyena oh, having a bath. I'm um, so Sandy. Okay, guys, uh, we're going to stay here with the hyena. We're going to cross straight to Mark. Um, he's got something very interesting and it's very close to our boundary. So we're going to go across to Mark right now. Well, we lost you folks going into the dry riverbed. Hopefully, the signal's pretty good. And I was hoping to find this leopard in the riverbed. And lo and behold, we come out here at Twin Dams and Brian and I noticed at the same time these impala being very, very particular about where they were looking. And the next minute we just saw a cat. <laughs> you want to play games, boy? Hello. Who says leopards don't get active in the heat of the day? Look at him. The impala, bachelor herd of impala near the side of the dam going crazy and uh, buffalo too. Mark, you go. We're at Twin Dams, he should be visual, f if he carries on south, should be visual from Gary Main in the next couple of minutes. He did, I, did you see how he was playing with it? He wanted a game. Just Mark, I'll go, Brian. Oh, sorry. Oh, he's going into the riverbed again. We can get there. I know exactly where he's going. He's going to a point, and I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to pick him up again. And I'm hoping that we're going to get signal down there, but I'm going to have to rush because he's going to a little promontory where I remember seeing one of the Matinga lines where it came around this bend and just almost a few feet above us. Right next to us was the male lion. Well, no, he wasn't so young, but the male lion was lying there. It looks like he might have made a play for one of these bachelor boy impala. But they kept their distance. They didn't even run away. They don't need to run away as long as they can keep an eye on the cat and shout at him. That he's not going to be able to do anything. He's not going to be able to make any move because it's just a waste of energy. The element of surprise is gone. But uh, hopefully, he, what is he's, he's on the dam wall of the other of the twin dam. Twin dams is called twin dams because there were two. There was one here in the drainage line, and there was the, the dam that we know as twin dams. But somewhere along the line, this riverbed must have burst through the dam wall. So there's the dam wall that he was on just a minute ago. Go ahead, Peter. So far, just me lost visual. I'm trying to pick him up again. Okay, I'll turn it there. Go again. Yeah, affirmative. Looks like he's heading. Well, he was heading down uh, into the Mawati, so he's probably still going to head south from the Mawati. He would drop 
down there. Okay, well, I'm going to try and find him. In the meantime, I'll go back to Brent. And hopefully we can find him again. We're just chilling here. Welcome back, guys. Um, well, Mark's going to try to find that leopard again. We've come to join me. Sorry, Sandy, back to your question, and then I'll move on to the lazy hyena. Um, no, the animals the animals in this area will migrate seasonally between water sources. Um, they're not, they won't leave the area completely, so you will definitely find uh, more elephants than that around certain areas, and some of the animals will travel for uh, bigger distances to feed, but they don't migrate like the Serengeti or Masai Mara and leave the area completely. There we have it. Hyena resting up in a in a little pan of water, Philemon's dip. Hyenas frequently will rest in pans and water when it's hot and they have the opportunity. Um, another possibility and another thing that hyenas use these little bits of water for regularly um, is to cache food. So if they have a carcass that they cannot finish but they don't particularly want to share, so it's not big enough that they would call in the other clan members. Um, what they'll do is they'll take pieces of that meat and, and store it in water um, ponds like this, and then they can come back at a later stage and feed on it. The reason they use water is because it masks the smell from other predators. Otherwise, the other predators would be able to find it quite quickly. heard something, not sure what. You can see he's almost, at some stage, dunked almost the whole head under the water. It's very interesting in something close by here. <laughs> Trying to get itself out of the nice cool mud. It's just, I'm just going to move forward. We'll come back to Aina. I'm just going to see what Aina might have been looking at. All right, let's just wait a second. Very interested in something just like that. I'm just going to have a quick look and then we'll shoot back to the hyena. You never know. Check Looking in this general direction. Can't see anything and there are no tracks. Maybe maybe the hyena heard something. But we can't yeah.
Let's go back. I just check the trucks here again quickly. Hyena tracks. Hyena's gone. Oh, there goes the hyena. It's actually heading back towards the... Oh, I just saw a bit of movement there. Uh, the den site um, that we see the babies at is actually in that direction. Okay, well, we're going to... Continue on towards Treehouse. afternoon Wendy from St. Petersburg. Um, Wendy would like to know would other animals take advantage of water holes dug by elephants? Most definitely Wendy a lot of animals will utilize water holes that have been dug by by elephants. As um, Mark's managed to find the leopard again, so we're going to cross. We're going to cross back to Mark um, right now, and we're going to keep uh, searching around what we can and see what else we can find. Okay, 
black puppy. But well, we managed to find them again, only, well, quite strangely, because as Bob Brian made a very good comment. Sorry, I just got to get on the radio. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, firm. If you come down into the Mawati, drive up the Mawati from Gary Main, probably best approach. I'd like to get a better view. It's very, very thick here, and he's likely to go in there. But we were drive. Brian said he saw him drop down off of the old damn wall. We drove past here a couple of minutes ago when you were with Brent. Didn't see him because we were a little bit lower than this, so we couldn't really, and he was lying in the grass. And as we were coming through a very, very tight area, I thought, said to Brian, well, we can get in there, but I don't know how we'll get out. And well, as we came through, he was, must have been lying in the grasses here. He got up and hissed at us. I would venture to say who he is, but I'd rather the viewers maybe have a guess as to who he is. Uh, there are not many cats that behave the way he does. What I'm going to do, I'm going to try to drive down to the sand. Oh, he's coming back. Let's see where he goes. Okay, come, Boyki. Come back and you settle down before I move. And there we go. Settling down so we can change position conveniently lying behind a stand of thatch grasses. That might be about the best actually in that little gap there, Brian. Back a little bit. There we go. Saturday afternoon with a cat. What a wonderful day. What a wonderful weekend. Hope it's improving your weekend, everyone. Making up for lost time this morning. It was so funny when we first saw him actually sort of, I wouldn't say he lunged at the vehicle, it was sort of a, kind of a cat game that a domestic cat plays where it hides and it rushes out at you and jumps and wants to play. Just out of sight of the dam, out of sight of the Impala, they've calmed down, they've stopped snorting, they've stopped alarming. Okay, copy sounds good. There's only one leopard really that, that hisses like he does. Well, I don't know if we're going to get your mic, but I can always try. OK, 
Can you? Can you see him? It's a bit awkward coming in from this side. I think it was Christina was asking a question, why is he so highly strung? I don't know if I don't really think he's highly strung. I think he's just just his personality. I remember Mishu used to occasionally snarl, and there was a time when Karula was doing a lot of it as well. The kind of question is very, very hard to answer. What's going through his head? Why is it that he feels it necessary to, to his bare his teeth, to warn us, to to do that sort of thing? Um, the thing is. In cat language, in cat body language, it's not really aggressive because his ears are not pointing back. His ears, when he's not, when he's hissing, it's more like a, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but a leopard that is stressed and aggressive and, well, I don't, like, don't really like to use the word highly strung, but in leopard body language, the position of the ears and the, 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 the movement of the tail, all the body language that an, a leopard gives off has some indication or has some uh, bearing on its mood. And the thing with him is that when he is, I've noticed when he does snarl or he does hiss, a lot of the time his ears aren't folded back in anger or aggression the way they would be if he was in that sort of frame of mind. This camera is funny. Lovely sharp picture.
Go ahead. Mark, yeah, go. From what I heard, she was on Torchwood Access heading west towards uh, Tilikat Line. channel 2. Andrew come in. Uh, there. I was pressing the wrong button. I always press the wrong button. People or machines. Andrew come in. Okay sorry radio changed channels. Uh, must have bumped it. My elbow again. Tala from Vermont, if a lion sleeps 20 hours a day, how long does a leopard sleep? 20 hours a day. Now I got it. Um, it's an average. It's not really a hard and fast rule. It's, it's, it, it's not like they have this built-in circadian rhythm that after sleeping for 20 hours, they wake up. There is, however, a, a, a general thing that cats tend to be very energy conscientious, very energy conserving. And one of the reasons for that is that cats are not very good hunters. Cats have a very low success rate when hunting and so when they've eaten they not only have to digest that food, but they have to conserve or preserve. They have to save all of that energy for their next hunt. They can't really afford to be bouncing around doing things without any end result. And, and so one finds that cats tend to sleep a lot. And... While lion, on one hand, because they live in groups, are likely to hunt larger prey, so in terms of the amount of food an individual gets might vary from that of a leopard, and a leopard might have, being a solitary hunter, to most, to, to, for the most part, has m more time to consume a kill and more time to, to spend on it, thereby getting... Uh, see. I'm getting tongue tied here. I think a leopard, for the amount of energy that it puts out, gets a lot more back in. So maybe you'll find that a leopard might be a little bit more active at times when lions are likely to be sleeping. But the other thing that is 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 very evident in, in my observations is that leopards are likely to be moving around at the time when the, its its competitors are least likely to be moving around. The times of the day, like now when it is hot. We're not likely to see lion moving around this time of the day. We're not likely to see hyena moving around this time of day. And where there are high populations of, of, of lion and hyena, one is likely to find leopard actually hunting in the heat of the day because there's less chance of this, their kill being stolen or less chance of them being interrupted. But we have to remember that everything related to animal behavior 
can only be generalized to a certain extent because every individual has a different mind, has a different manner, has a different personality, has a different way of doing things. So where one leopard might be sleeping 20 hours a day, another leopard might be sleeping 18. But even then, I'm very loath to apply sort of numbers to anything in terms of how much an animal eats and how often it eats or um, how much it sleeps or how much it drinks. You will find these, in, these numbers in books. And I've always had a problem with that because there isn't anything that is so routine that you can say for certain that that is what happens. Doesn't it largely depend on the individual? Well, it does. It very much mm -hmm. largely depends on the individual. But it's a, you know, I, I, I try my best not to answer the question <laughs> with, with that dreaded word, it depends. Yeah. But it does. It, unfortunately, it, that is the way life is out here. Because it depends on what the leopard has been doing. It depends on what area the leopard is in, it depends on temperature, it depends on when its last kill was, how hungry it is, whether there's an opportunistic moment to hunt. There are so many things in a leopard's life that mean that, uh, maybe he doesn't like me talking, you're going to come and jump on the car. Hello little boy, going into the sand, onto the sand. I should have my camera ready, and no, I haven't. Please lie down there. Peter, come in. Peter and Coral come in. Coral Station Zingwe is now mobile down the Mulwati towards Gary Main if anyone's interested. Yeah, you're breaking up. Okay, copy. Yeah, it's stone dimmer in the bottom. Um, might be time for Brent to fire up. Although not necessarily, but I might lose him. Peter and Koro, okay. Uh, where are you now? from four he's not coming towards Gary Main, visible from Gary Main. Albert, please don't block him there. Uh, negative. Okay. There is. Okay, Ingo is now um, headed east up towards Gary Main. Yes, thank you. Mm. Well, 
bit bigger as our leopard crossing over. And all right, thanks, guys. I'm going to leave the sighting. At least I think so. Unfortunately, I can't go further up. The vehicles have stopped where he's just crossed onto Little Gary. And I guess I have to relinquish the sighting. We can't follow him, unfortunately. Uh, he's gone deep in, judging by the way they're all pointing. So we can continue with our drive. Yeah, we'll go the other way. Oh, I'm not. Into the sun for a little bit and then we'll see where we can get to. We were lucky, we had a really nice time with him. Unfortunately, he's been. We've decided to move further south, so well, excuse my shades, it's very, very bright. So, sorry to have my sunglasses on, but it's burning my eyes today. A little bit of cloud making it very, very bright. Wonderful to catch a leopard this time of the day. I was wondering if I managed to address all questions that have come in. I'm going to head over to Brent. I'm going to an area away from Patrick. And whether we can be allowed to do is a flat piece. That might be a... Who is? Me or Brent? Okay, I have given a link. Welcome, welcome back everyone. Oh, just hang on, there's a, a lot of noise in my ear. Let me just turn that down for a second. So we checked around um, Treehouse Dam and that whole area. We had no tracks of anything. It's really quiet there. Um, so apparently Mark let me know that uh, this morning crew that was seen off our eastern boundary heading west um, towards us. So I'm going to go see if I can find some tracks. I'm going to sneak around in the sand, see what's there. Um, hopefully we get some luck. Other than that, we probably, if we get no luck in that area, probably check down towards Bofuzok Dam, see if we can find some elephants. Um, otherwise, we're just enjoying another wonderful afternoon. Central Drakensberger Junction. Lots of different tracks, but no leopard tracks. Civet, Janet, Hippopotamus, Hyena.
and a baboon. Check where tortured access joins our boundary from the next door. It's to the right. We're just going to check south a little bit down this way and if we get nothing we're going to head north again. It's always more difficult checking these boundaries and access roads because they get used a lot more and a lot of people are doing maintenance and whatnot so they do they're not really looking for tracks. That's why if I am going to drive these roads in the in the mornings I try to be the first vehicle on the road. So, so to speak, the newspaper is part of the press. The positive thing is if we do find any tracks, we know it's from the last two hours. Check the big mullahs. Might just see a leopard silhouette. You never know. So here's the access road. So she was seen last a little bit to our east here. Just want to check if she's come across. Some 
old male leopard tracks from a few days ago crossing the opposite direction. Turn the vehicle around. There's some funny looking tracks there I want to have a bit of a closer look at. Every two seconds, I just want to have a closer look at these tracks. Very interesting. So there's actually a, a fresh set of male leopard tracks that have been driven over, but they're definitely from this morning or um, or sometime during the day. But there's at this intersection, you see, there's been a lot of vehicles. But we're going to head back north now and possibly see if I can, if I go very slowly, we might be able to catch whether he went east or west. But no tracks of a female um, or Karula, which is what we were looking for. Check termite mounds very carefully. Good afternoon, Michelle from Massachusetts. Welcome on Drive. Um, 
Michelle is a candle maker and would like to know um, are there any plants that can be used um, for candles or for lights and what do people without electricity use for light? Well in this day and age they use kerosene lanterns but in the past um, there is one tree that was used very very extensively for lights and torches and it's coming up right now on the left how very very adequate this tree here on our left it's got two common names it's called a, a torch a torchwood or a green thorn it's got very large green thorns the seeds of this tree um, have a very concentrated oil that can be used to make a light um, hence the, the the common name torchwood the other things the seeds of this tree can be used for if you have a stagnant pool of water in a river uh, and you crush up the seeds into a powder and you place those inside the water it will kill all the fish that are inside that pool obviously it has to be a closed pool it can't be a flowing river um, and then you can harvest those fish and all the poison and stuff is within the, the, the stomach so as long as you gut it properly the flesh is completely safe to eat but um, other than that I'm not sure of any other trees that uh, or plants that were used um, for, for light or candle making um, the original Dutch settlers and British settlers used to use um, animal fat uh, specifically hippopotamus and eland um, were two of the favorites for candle making and soap for making soap as well um, but yeah that's the only tree I know of um, for sure that was used for um, light purposes I'm not seeing any tracks apart from car tracks so far. Oh, elephant! There's an Ellie walking down the road. I said we were going to look for elephants if we didn't find any, find any leopards. And an Impala and a Nyala in front of the elephant. Actually, I lie. I could do by the looks of things in front of the elephant. Look, so far it looks to be a lone Ellie bull. Gave the kudu a bit of a shoe. Out of my way, kudu. So funny that the lion is often referred to as the king of the jungle. But if we had to just go purely on who's really the king, an elephant bull, like this guy walking in front of us, would definitely take the cake as the king. Oh, he's a nice boy. trying to see doesn't look like he's in must at all just strolling it's definitely my kind of traffic jam I 
got a whiff of musk, but I, as I say, I'm trying to have a look at his trucks, whether there's those very distinct um, dribbles that from the penal sheath, but I can't see any, but I did thought I think I got a, a whiff, but I can't see any secretions from the penal sheath. Oh, there is, yes, there is. So he is in must, I, could, I thought I smelt it. Um, very difficult to see, I didn't, obviously wasn't looking at the tracks well enough, but I can see um, dripping from the penal sheath. Uh, and that's a sure sign they're in must. I mean, their testosterone increases incredibly at this, uh, when they're in this period. So what he's doing now is he's on the march, looking for some ladies, cruising the cheetah cut line. Elephant bulls, um, when they are in must, can be quite a menace to, to the breeding herds um, unless there's uh, females in estrus. So elephants will only mate when the female is in estrus and the male is in must. Let's try to see if we can see. Yeah. I don't know if I'm too close for you to get onto that. Let me just move a bit. That wet spot there. I'm sure you know. I'm just going to move it. There, you see next to that elephant footprint, there's that dribbles. Oh, I'm a little bit too close. If I do that, even with. No? That should work, eh? Just, okay. We're not going to waste too much time. But you can see where he stopped. That's the, the dribble out of the penal sheet. That is one of the indicators that he is in must. Um, if you that's it's easy to see there because that's where he stopped in the road but normally with the tracks like if you're tracking an elephant on foot and you start seeing those little dribbles um, when uh, around his tracks you know you should probably not try walk into that elephant bull at that time just in case his hormones are are raging and they can be a bit temperamental when they're in this state I mean but most of the time they're completely fine but on foot, everything's different. You have to be that much more careful. Younger bulls and must seem to be, tend to be a little bit more, a little bit more boisterous or aggressive. Um, and that's probably because they've got a lot more competition um, for mating rights. So, you generally find your big bulls will all come in, uh, come into must around the same time, and that coincides with uh, when most of the females are in estrus, um, or the highest percentage of females are in estrus. So your your biggest and strongest elephant bulls will be in must in that time, and that's sort of the best time for breeding. And that varies through different parts of Africa. Um, your younger bulls, because an elephant bull reaches sexual maturity um, probably from around in his early teens, but he probably won't get a chance to mate uh, successfully till he's about 30. Good afternoon, Diane. So you confirmed, Diane? 
Diana. Confirm the name again, please. Diana from New York. Uh, welcome on Drive with us this afternoon. Uh, Diana would like to know if you can you tell um, if a female is an estrus, like you can tell that a male is in must. Uh, you can, but it's very, very difficult because they, they secrete from their temporal glands. There's glands on the side of their heads, um, but they can secrete when they are under times of stress, when they're pregnant. So it's very difficult to say that that's the exact time. Um, and must in males varies. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on the figures. I'll double check for you right now. Hey guys, one second, I'm just checking here. Yeah, I'm just going to catch up with them and then I'll keep checking in my book. Well, we've got some very fresh elephant dug in the road. Landmines. Just make sure we don't... Whoop, whoop, whoop. We missed them. Okay, if you zoom in on the penal sheath there, before he turns, ah, oh, he's gonna turn. Um, just keep going in, he might turn sideways again. You can actually see the dripping, there we go. You can actually see the dripping from the penal sheath when he stood sideways there. Okay, sorry, let me just double check here. Good afternoon, Da in Wisconsin. Um, sorry, guys, I'm going to keep up with them, and then I'll maybe once when we stop following them, I'll, I'll check on that how long they must for. Um, da would like to know how many times an elephant will mate with the same cow. Um, I was just actually reading past that page right now. Um, the females actually mate with a, a number of bulls. 
and it's it's quite unusual for it to mate with the same bull more than once. Um, but it has been recorded that, that she can mate with the same bull multiple times, but it's 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 rather an exception to the norm. Yes, big boy. Good afternoon, Joyce from New Hampshire. Welcome on Drive. Uh, Joyce would like to know how does an elephant keep itself clean when the water holes are drying up? Well, I don't think they worry too much about that since they spray themselves with mud and sand to keep cool and to control ectoparasites. So I, I think keeping clean is the least of an elephant's worries. One Madolan Drove in Must Mobile North Cheetah Cut Line, uh, very close to Buffalo's Hook Cut Line. Okay, guys, we're getting quite close to our boundary. I've got a, a chance here to jump around in front of him. Hello big man, yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. So we're just gonna try jump around in front of him. So just bear Hi everyone. I think it sounds like Brent vehicle broke. Um, I'll be with you in a sec. I'm on Arathusa at the moment and I just made myself known that I'm here. And all sorts of things has happened all at once. You came to us and had a vehicle going out and well trying to hear what's going on on Arathu's radio so that I don't break protocol and arrive at a sighting or something and disturb some people. Very important. We have to follow radio procedures. We are sort of a brief intrusion in the lives of all the safari vehicles and we don't want to alienate the very people that are allowing us access to their property so it's important to do these things but I thought since we haven't been here for a little while and there is going to be a sunset of note I think just my prediction there are one or two places that we need to have a look at and I say the most important of all is this lovely big open area that is the Arathusa airstrip. And we'll start off on the south, on the northern end, and hopefully wind our way down to the south and see what there is. Some impala up ahead. Uh, 
it out. These impala would have been in much thicker vegetation down there in the drainage. Oh, there's water buck too, young male water buck. Much like the impala, these animals are slowly making their way out onto the open grassland that is the surrounding the airstrip, the lovely big open area. And albeit artificial, it's still the kind of habitat that these animals need in the evenings because, well, the moon's going to be pretty late. It's going to be pretty dark until midnight before the moon rises. Lovely big water buck. There's some others deeper in the Gwari thicket. We'll get to see them as they maybe come out. And as the afternoon cools down, they slowly make their way. Maybe even later, after sunset, we'll come back and we'll find them all out there in the open. Oh, I left my binoculars in Zigger. forward <laughs> oh, the ox pictures that I'm hearing Hello children, big herd of impala, I'm going to leave them browsing because I know we're going to see them coming out into the open in a little while, and that little group is but a fraction of the whole herd, very large herd. Oh, they're building run-up strips from the airstrip now concrete bases for planes to do a run-up, but that is some, especially twin-engine planes need to, the propellers, they need to wind them up full revs with brakes on. And to do that on a dust strip, especially a plane like the Caravan with a turboprop, get dust into that engine, it's not a very good idea. Or the stones and sand that get whirled up, that they scratch paint, I suppose. I'm not sure if you can notice it, for those of the viewers out there that have been with us for a little while and you've been on these drives, you can see that the grasses are very short along the edges of the airstrip. They've been cut, a tractor and a slasher. Very important because the last thing you want to have happen is an animal running onto the airstrip at the last minute, so it gives better visibility. Unfortunately, what it does is it opens it up and makes animals want to be here more because there are shorter grasses, but as long as it's daylight and it's warm, not likely to be animals on the airstrip that come out later in the evenings. Well, I've had some pretty hair-raising experiences. I think most of the places that I've lived in, in, in other parts of Africa, I think, I know. Um, in fact, all of them. I can't think of one, really. All the places that I've lived in Botswana, Zambia, Tanzania and Kenya. The only way to get into those places but what did he say? Okay. 
getting confused with radio talk. Is that a dark shape over there, nine o'clock? It is a dark shape, but it's probably just a dark bush. I swapped over from Jigger to Wendy this afternoon. I think I left my binoculars in Jigger. I think it's just a dark bush. Where would we be looking at? The little left, so that tall tree in the centre, go left of it. And yeah, just there, that dark, I thought it might have been a... Mm -hmm. It is, but it's kind of got the shape of an elephant standing in the yeah, shade. It does. But yes, as I was saying, ev everywhere else that I've lived in, in other parts of Africa, the only way to get in, other than several days drive, was by small plane. And it was up to me pretty much all the time to be able to be at the airstrip before a plane arrived. And these are a lot smaller planes, or well, they were in those days, smaller planes than you have now. Now, the Cessna Caravan is the plane of choice, even up in East Africa now. But in the old days, it was... 172s and 206s, little four and six seater planes, basically like a little VW Beetle with wings on it. In the case of the 172, it's more like a little mini with wings in terms of space. And they're very delicate little planes, so you can't really have any animal, even if it's a bird, on the airstrip. I've had some wonderful experiences with wild dog in Sulu when I had wild dog on the airstrip on numerous occasions. One time when my boss was flying in, he had a 404, which was a twin engine, twin engine Cessna. And I knew he was coming in and he would come in early in the morning and it was still quite cool and the wild dog on the airstrip and Driving up and down trying to chase them didn't work, so I tried it on foot. And of course they'd run off into the bush, and then I'd turn around and go back to where the plane would stop. And then they'd come back onto the airstrip, further up the airstrip, to see where I was and to see what I was doing. And I played that game when Charles had to circle the airstrip three times because the dogs wouldn't leave the airstrip. There'd been an odd unfortunate accident or incident. Um, last minute animals coming onto the airstrip. Uh, shocking experience with an Egyptian goose that came out of nowhere and said he was hit by the prop and then they're always the odd pilot error thing where sometimes pilot comes in a bit too fast and runs off the end of the strip but I think a handful of incidents compared to the number of planes that land on these little dust strips and of course the experience of those pilots be able to do so. Just by the way, we have finalized that we are allowed back on Arethusa. I think maybe Andrew's mentioned something. It sounds like there's some questions being asked, but yes, we are able to come back to Arethusa. It wasn't, it was, well, I don't know what happened. It wasn't that there was, that we were not allowed. I think it was with, with the drives being extended. I think it was needed to be, that needed to be ironed out whether or not the traversing on Arethusa was extended along with the drive. So I think we needed to finalize that rather than assume. I see some water and a beautiful sky. And unfortunately some other people have got the same idea to come and have a sundowner. Yeah, all the wildies. Are we going to turn around? We're going to have to turn around. I don't, fortunately,
<laughs> okay. Andrew saying that uh, Twitter's a buzz. Twitter's a tweet. Twitter's a Twitter. With new the cr Brent crashing the vehicle. No. Maybe I said something wrong. Maybe I said that the, the, the vehicle crashed. The broadcast crashed from the vehicle earlier. I think that's where it stemmed from when I left the Leopard. So, unfortunately, we, I'd love to sit and watch the Wildies and the, we'll have to move a little bit further south, north, north, we are south, for the sunset. But there is a vehicle at the southern tip, guide and his guests that are having sunset, and I, it's just not right to be intruding on their sundowners, their, their one moment of... of beautiful African sunset. Look at this folks, this is absolutely gorgeous. So we'll just move a little bit further north away from them, we'll still have a lovely sunset. But be out of sight and leave them to their privacy. zebra dung there appeared to be a lot of zebra around too that might also only come out again in the evening the wildebeest are out already If we go to the northern tip of the airstrip, away from folks that are behind us, we'll even see it over the Drakensberg Mountains, I think. And there's a little spot there where you get a glimpse over the mountain. And I would thought that the grass is being cut, they'd likely to come back again. ideal jackal habitat. There was a pair of side-striped jackal living here during the early summer months. much luck today. I guess because it's such a lovely day, there is a vehicle on the northern end of the airstrip. Try and find a middle ground. This little dip that we're in, fortunately, is being a dip. 
can't see the horizon. But before I go anywhere else, let's... welcome to Africa. And a beautiful Saturday afternoon sunset here. Juma Arethusa. This is wild earth. Our wonderful wild earth. My quarry brush. <laughs> that is awesome. Hello, Al. Nice to hear from you. I haven't heard from you in a while. Al's just letting us know that Shadow, Shadow's cub. Shadow is a leopard that lives here. Shadow is Karula's daughter. In fact, first daughter. And there was a time a few months ago, this is for those of you who don't really know what I'm talking about, just to fill you in, a little bit of background. Shadow has a sister, Tingana. And two of them were Karula's first cubs, born I think in around 2006, if I'm not mistaken. And Shadow has taken up territory here on Arethusa. We, we were lucky enough to see her a few times. In fact, there was one day we found her here on the airstrip, not far from where we are now. It was a beautiful sighting. We followed her into the drainage line. But prior to that, she had made a kill. It looked like, I think it was a baby from Pala, if I'm not mistaken amongst a very thick Tamburti forest and the cub was up the up the tree with the kill it was a young cub of only a few months old and there were a bunch of hyena lying around in the Tamburti thicket that were just eager to get either a scrap of that impala if it fell down or the cub if it came down and it seemed to go on, it seemed to be a bit of a stalemate that went on for a couple of days and of course it makes everybody worry because we experienced the the sad loss of Karula's latest cub and I guess that was very fresh in our minds. But it 
somehow resolved itself. Somehow she, she got the cub out of the tree. And, well, Ellen is just saying that uh, evidently Shadow and her cub are doing fine. We need to keep an ear out. That would be, you're right, Ellen, actually. You're quite right. It would be a great thing if one of these days we can come and see another cat or two. I could sit here with the sunset forever. I think it's really a beautiful sunset tonight. Mm. What would it look like if you zoomed, I don't know if you have, that, that tree that's in the middle of the fire, that tree that's on fire, just happens to be a really nice tree. Little marula, maybe? No. Not sure. But you couldn't paint that without it looking surreal or artificial. you can now sorry I don't like to tell the camera <laughs> second <laughs> wonderful okay but this light fading let's move along I saw some giraffe tracks and I was hoping to find him as we got onto Arethusa, but unfortunately he must have moved too far south. I'm kind of hoping he'd be here on the airstrip. We haven't seen giraffe for a little while. Actually, there are also some lovely dead trees that we're going to go past on this section of road that might make a nice silhouette to enhance the evening's mood. Africa. It's not all about animals, it's all about the experience, it's all about the feeling, the immersion, the quietness, the tranquility, the peace. And this, this, this feeling that I think a lot of people get when they come to Africa, this feeling of, of, of primal, primal belonging that is deep in the recesses of our psyche, that, that once upon a time we were part of this. And that our current modern world takes so much out of life at just a moment in this environment and, and I think that's what I'm trying to get across by stopping for a sunset. It's just a moment of this, a moment of almost sunset solitude. I suppose we should have been here. Okay, we now know better. But with, the, with the sun moving back into the northern hemisphere, at a, at a rapid rate, we're going to be able to watch it move up the mountain. But for the next few days, I mention it to Brent and, and Scott when he gets back. Maybe if we can to get to a place like this, just if we're around here at sunset. Um, there's one spot. A beautiful escarpment. Drakensberg Mountains. And that gap that you see now in the middle of the screen is where the canyon is. You go up into that gap is the canyon and then it gets very very lush and green and there are waterfalls and there's a very big dam, the Blood River Dam, Swadini.
Tell me if you see a good gap or I'll try and keep my eye on the monitor and the road and the sky and try not to drive into a tree. People are asking if Brent's okay after the crash, but there, there wasn't a crash, there's no crash, it wasn't a crash, it was a system crash, it was a, a an electronic crash, not Software. a physical um, vehicle crash. The, I must have said something that sparked that, I guess. Brent's, or Jigger crashed, crashed as in signal dropped crash. <laughs> I understand that it might have been taken up the wrong way. Oh! Crashing to Brent. Mm. Well, that's another thing we use the word crash for. A quick link. If we're gonna, if we have, when I had that leopard at Twin Dams and Brent was being, was on, on, on camera and Andrew needed to crash to us very quickly in case we lost the leopard. I think this is the spot to be. This is the spot to be. I think this is the... Then maybe a little bit further, but you're right. This is definitely the spot to be. Better than the S. Well, I don't know. At the top of the airstrip would have been nice. Yeah, and there was that one little spot at the bottom of the airstrip where it would have been... A, but this is definitely a much better view over the the vastness of the bush I mean, all the way to the mountain. There's there a lot of what is between us and the mountain is wildlife. Closer to the mountain, closer to the mountain, obviously a lot of agriculture that has taken up the uh, higher rainfall, lush of it, the lusher soil or, or more fertile lands. You look and get those horn bulls. This quarry is in the way, and the horn bulls are flying. There were three horn bulls, now there's just the one. Oh. And it's I didn't stop right. Of course, there are other critters, the other children, the other people, no, not people, animal people, the other characters, that's the word I'm looking The other characters we like to come across here at Arathusa are things like the Birmingham males, maybe the Styx lion, maybe the Talala breakaways. There, there are some animals that don't come onto Juma, but they eventually they come this far onto Arethusa. Tonight though we have a one a once in a lifetime. You will never, you can live here for a thousand years. You will never see a sunset like today. Again. And just when you think it's the most beautiful and the best and the one of these days we'll be here and we'll see another one. And then I'm going to ask you which one do you prefer or when what's your best sunset and that will give you an idea of how difficult it is living in a place like this to choose something that is better than any other when everything is can be so beautiful but uh, they, 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 you can't really compare there's no means to compare because they're different apples and oranges as they say I don't know where today has gone this afternoon. Like sunset already. There, like it's coming out of that dead tree.
<laughs> it's the thumb, it's not Brian. The thumb's operating the camera this afternoon. <laughs> now I've been taking it easy on the back end. Amazing what the thumb can do when it puts his nail to it. Question time. Hello, Gene. Gene comes from the Tar Heel State in North Carolina. Oh, look at this giant jewel beetle. Mm, I want to. Well, I don't want. I just want to. Uh, Sorry, Mark. wasn't big enough. <laughs> bigger than a hummingbird. I know it's there. Uh, yeah, I am almost impossible. We landed somewhere in one of those combretums. A lot of feed in the combretum. Giant jewel beetles. Probably 30 or even 40 years as larvae in hardwoods before they become adults. I have to find one to show you. I did bring some remarkable creatures this afternoon, but we didn't have time to see them, so we'll leave that for the morning. There's something that I'm going to do periodically when there's time, if we're not seeing too much, we'll look at some of nature's remarkable children that we don't get to see because we can't take the camera off unless I can park next to a tree that's got an insect or something and we can zoom in. Anyway, Jean in North Carolina was asking about lightning bugs or fireflies, wanting to know if we do have. We do, Jean, indeed, but mostly only along sort of river courses where there's water, maybe around some of the dams at night. Um, they are mostly only associated with, with humid summer evenings during the rains probably a little bit dry for them now they're actually beetles and with the fireflies or your lightning bugs we get another insect called a glow worm which is neither a worm or it's not a worm either but it does glow and it is actually a firefly female but the same insect the male has wings and he flies around and he has a flashing light and they don't, they're not synchronous. I know there are some places in the world where fireflies are synchronous, that they'll all flash together. The females, on the other hand, as a glowworm, they are, they have a constant light and they don't become winged adults. They stay in the sort of semi larval form and they just lie on the edges of the water and the grasses to be able to, and they just glow to attract the male. Anyways, we're making our way back to Juma. In the interim, I'm going to hand you over to Brent, and I'll see you in a little while, everybody. Welcome back guys, we're just at Sydney's dam at the moment and as we came up the hippos are starting to come out of the water and get quite active, there's actually been a bit of playing and chasing each other around, um, as it gets drier um, the hippos will start leaving the water earlier and earlier because they might have to travel further distances uh, to find enough grazing, but see they're not quite coming out yet, they're sort of playing, he said he came out, he's going back in, it was just such a nice, nice scene here, sitting at Sydney's. It's also quite nice to sit, because we can't go there, uh, to sit a little bit further away. And you get a, a lot better feeling of the atmosphere um, that we're experiencing, that we're seeing. It's just, it's definitely probably one of my favorite times of the day. It's just such a, and we've got hippos playing in the dam. Franklin calling. See, there's a bath or four hippos in that little spot there next to that uh, wood. One came right out of the water and rushed back in. So we're hoping they're going to... And then one was doing the sort of dolphin porpoising. Oh, he's in a good mood. And see, there we go. There's 
there's a little one off to the right, chop, under the water. The other thing is, as, as it dries and it gets cooler, we're going to start seeing hippos sunbathing, which is also quite fun during the heat of the day or in the mornings. They actually sort of lie on and create hippo beaches. <laughs> That's a subad out there having a good time. Oh, um. If we pan across to the far left corner, there's some action happening there. Just saw lots of big splashes. You can see the different little... So it's quite interesting, T hippos are, are very territorial or the males particularly when they're in water but when they're out of water they're not territorial when they're feeding although the territorial fights will sometimes go onto the land and they will fight on the land as well but it's all over the little sp spot in the water rather than grazing or whatnot oh can you hear them mm. oh, 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 oh. there's an old joke I was taught by Umbugush in Botswana, which is a, in Bogush is a, a river, a river bushman that uh, lives on the Okavango river system. And he says, you never know whether hippos are either the best jokers in the world or the worst jokers in the world. So they all go underwater and tell each other a joke. And then they come up laughing. <laughs> and you never know whether they're laughing at the fact that you don't know the joke or that the joke's so bad they can only tell it to each other because no one else would laugh. Such a wonderful setting. Not quite ready to come out. I thought they might come out while we we're sitting here. They still might. Such a wonderful sky as well. Another tough day in the office. Andrew coming. Andrew, do you think uh, I should possibly sign out now before we have a, another crash? <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry guys, I'm just joking there. Apparently a lot of you thought I had a crash. Uh, I promise you we didn't. Uh, <laughs> we're still here and there's no holes in the car. Um, we're all in one piece. The other thing that's wonderful about just sitting quietly at this time of the day, it is when your predators get moving. So you do hear, quite often you'll hear lion roaring, leopard calling, or alarm calls, spotting them on the move. Uh, just to give you, the reason we're in this area, um, just there was an update I got about um, the Nkuhuma Pride, and they crossed north into the Manuleti Game Reserve, uh, or northwest. So, in the short time I've been here, when they do cross into the Manuleti, they seem to come back through in this area. Uh, not every time, but quite a few times. So, the last time they were seen was last night. So, I thought, why not just take a chance? It's such a wonderful spot to sit for a while, listen and see it if, the, if we had any luck with the lions crossing. Eleanor is asking whether hippo are what a hippo feet called, are they hooved um, or not? Because they are even toed ungulates, um, which are generally what uh, hooved animals. Um, but hippos, when they say hooved, a rhino is also hooved, but it's not really hooved. They have a pad with a large nail on the front of the toe. Um, so a hippo is an even toed ungulate. So Theoretically, um, it is a hooved animal, but practically it's more of a, a footed animal with large toenails. But at, in terms of the, the foot structure and makeup and its ancestry, it, it is an even-toed ungulate and therefore a hooved animal. Okay, guys, um, thanks for joining us on Drive this afternoon. Really happy that Mark managed to find you that leopard. Um, and it was really nice spending some time with that uh, big Eddie bull. Um, it's been a wonderful afternoon, and always a, I always love being out. Just to say, I really love my office. It's incredible. Um, but other than that, I shall see you bright and shiny tomorrow morning, hopefully, for Drive. So wherever you are in the world, have a pleasant evening, morning, day. 
and hope to see you tomorrow. Enjoy, and I'm going to hand over to Mark for the last little bit of drive. Hi everybody. Welcome back to Wendy. I thought I'd stop by this little spot as we came back to Juma because we found some wonderful little nocturnal creatures here last night. And I wanted to see if they were still here. Maybe it was just a fluke. And I do see a little head popping out, but there's just an ear. It's a little bit far away. Let's try and move a little bit. And I really just want to get the silhouette against that sky and they pop their heads out. There we go. <laughs> giving us a good look. Turning the head like that is allowing it to, to focus easier, trying to get in a, a bit of fix on what we are all about. If you weren't with us last night, I was saying that push babies aren't able to rotate their eyes within the eye socket the way we are. Their eyes are so big that they fill the sockets and there's not enough space for eye movement. So they have to move their heads to be able to focus on things, which is what this one is doing. To the background sounds of the daytime ending and the final calls of Franklin as they settle down, just letting each other know where they are settling gonna jump. No jump child. Well, we spent some time last night. I want to leave them be. I think it's just such a, it's, it's, it's so iconic. It's just so, it's so incredible. Not much bigger than a squirrel. In fact, smaller than a squirrel. The smallest nocturnal primate, the smallest primate 
not only nocturnal, but the smallest primate we have here in South Africa. We're going to leave it be. And let's drive around. Maybe there's a porcupine or a genet cat, which isn't a cat, or something else. Bye bye, children. Andrew. It's not easy to find the actual animal itself and the only way that I found those bush babies initially was because of the reflection that one gets from the eyes. Really went to there. New shortcut to the hyena den. Um, most animals that we have out in the wild have a remarkable adaptation in the eye that it gives them much better nocturnal vision. And well, as fast as the speed of light travels, that's how fast you get a reflection back. So yeah, one is not really looking for the shape of an animal, you're not looking for anything in particular. And over time one develops a, a, an idea for what it is that you're looking at when all you really do see is an eye. Not always easy. Colors don't really vary much, and to a large extent, it's the, the angle that one's looking at. Um, although most of the prey species tend to be a sort of a greenish color. The idea is only really to look for those nocturnal children that we're not going to see during the day. We don't want to be shining lights on the diurnal animals anyway. Or there's no need to really. No one never shines lights on elephants. We don't shine lights on young cats, young animals.
Cubs and Cups. Kind of bird similar to the plovers, it's a ground dwelling bird. It is a long legged, big eyed insect eater. It's probably been a spotted, I guess. Only saw it fly away. Might have landed on the road again further up. Believe it or not, even insects and spiders, the hunting, the ground dwelling hunting spiders, their eyes also reflect. The smaller the eye, the narrower the angle needs to be to be able to see that eye, which is why a lot of the time, because of the difference in the angle when there's something to the side of us the camera won't see the reflection or the camera person for that matter the only time you are likely to see any reflection is if something's directly ahead of us when we in the same line of sight as the, as, as the spotlight and of course larger animals the angle can be wider because they have bigger eyes and I discovered many years ago that I think before headlamps, I think I don't think there were any headlamps, real headlamps on the market other than really bulky things. But I made my own when I was in East Africa because I was out on foot a lot and I was like, oh, it was an owl. A little white faced scops owl. I'll talk about that later. But I don't want to shine directly at the child.
Actually, I shouldn't have given you the name. I should have asked for guesses. This is an owl. It's one of the small owls. It is only about maybe eight inches top of the head to the top tip of the tail. Twenty centimeters, maybe. I'm wondering if that's about the size of a spotted owl in North America, the notorious or infamous beautiful orange eyes. Now, just like the bush baby, the owl also with those big eyes cannot move its eyeballs within its sockets, so it has been gifted with an extra few cervical or neck vertebra to be able to move the head in the ways that owl do. owls do move their heads almost a 180 degrees. Lovely big facial disc. I have no doubt that that white around the eye possibly does assist with, oops, with nocturnal vision. But it also helps channel sound. <laughs> Raisa, there's your owl. Before Andrew could even send it to me, the owl was there. So somehow got the message before the email. Okay, we're gonna leave leave Al to hunt. But those facial discs also serving to channel sound to the ears and be able to stereoscopically pinpoint where the prey is, where an insect is moving. summer evenings have come back. It was getting cool a couple of weeks ago, but we've got, it was so hot last night, most of us couldn't sleep at first because it was so hot and humid. And tonight again, not very humid, but just a lovely warm summer's evening. And maybe because there is a change in atmospheric pressure, and maybe there are changes, and maybe there is going to be a little bit of a new moon shower coming along in the next few days. I can't believe how yellow these bush willows are getting though. And I think it's more from cold than from lack of rain. Because they do store all their nutrients and moisture in their roots when, this, when the winter comes along. And it's normally triggered by changes in temperature rather than lack of rainfall. Gosh, there's been hippo walking here already. We drove here earlier today and there's fresh hippo tracks. I wonder if it's a hippo coming up from another dam. Heading to We're going to go past Gowrie Dam just on our way back to quarantine. I'd like to see who or what might come out onto the open area this evening. We haven't seen a white-tailed mongoose for a long time. It's time to see a white-tailed mongoose. Hello, Impala. We're not going to stop for them because we don't want to disturb them. Good night, Impala. 
tree frog not there anymore in that particular tree. Here's the thick knee in the road. Methinks a spotted thick knee. What do you think, Racer? RC? Birders? A little bit bright for the poor child. Slightly softer light. I'm going to switch off so that it doesn't... When, when you have a bird in front of you at night, you have to put the lights on. I can see it's still there, but now it's flown. If a bird flies and there are lights on it, it will fly into bushes and trees. It won't be able to see where it's going because the light will create a tunnel of light. And if only people would do that when they, when they see owls on the road, I don't mean switch your lights off completely, but dim them, drop it to even just park lights and slow down. People expect these poor children to be able to fly up and get out of the way in time, but they don't realize that there's, well, you know, deer in the headlight syndrome. Nothing they can do about it. They get hit. And we have a really sad situation here where the, uh, what is that? Well, I don't know, I don't know baby water, but we'll try and look for it in the morning. But I really don't want to shine the light on it. It's gone behind a bush now. But in the maize growing areas of the country where the maize trucks transport maize, of course, so much, so, so much maize falls off of the truck, lands on the sides of the road or in the road, and then, of course, at night, all the rodents come out to feed on it. And consequent or subsequently, so do the... The, the nocturnal predators, the owls. Joanne and Race are saying water thickening. Okay. Also wanted to create a bit of controversy. We are next to the dam. I can hear some water thickening. up onto quarantine. Call them dick cops. Until it was necessary to align ourselves with more international nomenclature, people would understand what we were talking about because there's thick knees in the rest of the world, and we would talk about a, a dick cop, which essentially means a thick head. And it's one of those things about common names. Oh, it was a night job. It's been a lovely Saturday afternoon for us. I hope it's been a great Saturday morning, afternoon, evening, whatever your time zone may have been or may be. And I want to thank you for joining all of us here, Brent and Alex on Jigger, myself and Brian here on Wendy. Andrew's back in final control from all of us here at Wild Earth. It's been great. And we'll see you tomorrow morning, our Sunday morning. Remember we have Five side chat tomorrow evening and who knows during drive tomorrow we can chat about maybe something to talk about in five side chat might be an idea and of course not forgetting that little thumb bye 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 everybody
tongue tied. Bye bye. Love you lots. See you tomorrow. Munzuku, Keshu, Wanyana.